assessing the contribution of stylistics to literary history is not only a difficult task, it is almost a contradiction in terms. Stylistics, it is commonly said, has to do with style, that's to say, with the individual, the uncommon. Style is allegedly what sets a writer apart. It is also usually thought that uh, originality is the first aesthetic, hence literary value. An artist, hence a writer, is supposed or expected to bring something new, to give words new meanings, to, uh, to uh, even to give grammar a new structure. He or she has to uh, has in a certain way to clear the table and even to step out of history. Stylistics has consequently not only focused on the individual level, but also followed Leo Spitz's injunction to look for what is new in the writer's language and to overlook what is not. This is why stylistics was often reproached to ignore history, a reproach Jean Starobinsky tried rather unsuccessfully, in my mind, to shrug off in his 1970 preface to the French edition of uh, Spitzer's essays are in stylistics. Stylistic studies, as descriptions of some chronicle aesthetic structures, could easily be blamed for being unhistorical. But for Spitzer, history is everywhere. It could be argued that Starobinsky does not accurately um, describe Spitzer's method which is generally, as you know, often centered and aimed most of the time at accounting for a stylistic particularity rather than for a linguistic, let alone aesthetic structure. It could also be argued that the very title of Spitz's last important book, Linguistics and Literary History, should be read or could be read as linguistics versus literary history. But it's not my intentions today to discuss this at length, nor is it in my intentions to uh, find fault with the Austrian born philologist for failing to not the um, fate not, uh, stylistics and literary history. I will though keep in mind that stylistics has obviously always had a problem with history, in that it always had to face the accusation of an historicity. I might then find it wise or prudent to uh, be as radical as the young Roland Barthes, who in his uh, 1953 essay, Writing Digni Zero, discarded style as a non-literary category as long as style is restricted to individual writing habits. It is only indeed if stylistic ceases to be obsessed with originality or personality, which are ideological rather than scientific categories, that it may contribute to literary history by offering what God conceived as, quote, a history of the literary language, which would be neither a history of the language nor a history of styles. But all the signs are today that such a project is more and more gaining support, since there should be more to stylistics than the short sighted descriptions, uh, short sighted observation of individual styles. When Spitzer wrote that he wanted his stylistics to quote, bridge the gap between linguistics and literary history, he was mostly using literary history with the old meaning of history of writers, possibly, but not even necessarily, contextualized in their times, cultures, or societies. He had not in mind that a truly historical uh, stylistics was possible nor even needed, because, as previously said, that would have sounded to his ears as contradiction in terms. True it is that, um, conceived as a historical discipline, stylistics can no more be defined as the science of linguistic or even stylistic singularities. 
even mainly language oriented, it faces the same questions and challenges as every history for uh, all, all historical disciplines in general. The first and the most difficult one is why and how do things change? Uh, to take but one example, why and how did around um, uh, 1860 European novelists feel the need of something that would later be called free indirect discourse? Why and how did free indirect discourse spread then and not before, even though one can easily find traces of it before 1900? 1800. Why and how did it specialize in the rendering of fields, work and speech? Why and how did uh, Germany, but not England, consider it as a French invention? Such questions cannot be answered by delving into Gustave Flaubert's psyche in order to find its spiritual roots, as Spitzer would have been tempted to do. They can neither, neither be answered by limiting one's observation to the sole free indirect discourse, as linguists may be tempted to. For no stylistic feature exists by itself, but only as, a, as part of a possibly coherent set of stylistic features, which also include, as far as free indirect discourse in, fr in French is concerned, um, impersonal or even non verbal sentences, a specific use of certain tenses, such as, and not notably of the end effect. Uh, the multiplication of abstract nouns, and notably of nouns derived from adjectives, etc. Why did such uh, linguistic features come out together in the second part of the 19th century? Why was free in the oh, sorry. Why was um, free indirect discourse one of them? For a linguist, the functioning of free and direct discourse in Zola is not completely different as in uh, Madame de la Fayette, let alone in La Fontaine, but from a truly stylistic point of view, it should hardly be called by the same phrase, since in all three cases it does not belong to the same set of features. Writing and explaining the emergence, transformation, disappearance, of such sets of features in the literary context is what stylistics could or even should, should uh, also be about. The second challenge historical stylistics has to face is, unsurprisingly, that of periodization. The Israeli philosopher Judith Schenker recently insisted on the difficulty of, distinguish, of distinguishing consistent periods without making it impossible to think changes and evolution. Michel Foucault, she said, insisted too much on the inner coherence of epistemies and had consequently no other possibility to explain changes and evolution than to consider them as sudden and complete revolutions in sensibilities. It may seem wiser than to get a more balanced and dynamic view, and I would personally privilege the conception presented by Mario Kratz in 1970. A period is a space of time dominated by a system of literary norms, canons, and conventions, the evolution of which can be retraced. Introduction, diffusion, diversification, integration, and disappearance. The evolution of stylistic devices is closely related to the general evolution of collective linguistic and literary sensibilities. I, um, as um, I said before, a stylistic feature exists only as part of a system but the perception of the whole system is determined by historically built and commonly shared representations, what we call in French des imaginaires. Stylistics then needs linguistics to explain how things work in texts, but linguistics cannot explain, for example, why presenting narratives 
did not even exist before 1900 or remains a few until the 50s. Neither can it explain if there is any link between the use of a certain dance and, let's say, sentence length or word order at a given time of the history of literature. All this makes me very suspicious when I read studies on a particular future in the course of those of a particular writer. Such studies, though, are, as you probably know, what mainstream stylistics mostly produces. They usually take it for granted that a very technical, linguistics-based um, description will sort of naturally pave the way to a relevant interpretation of a given phenomenon. The problem is that the, observ the observation scale is not relevant. A stylistic feature cannot be described if not within a complete system at a given time. I will now try to illustrate and to test those quite common sense and commonplace introductory remarks with one example. The French stylistic influence and the French stylistic a reference uh, on and in English prose writing between 1880 and 1930, that's to say during the, the late Dorian and early modernist periods. For 50 years, indeed, English writers felt that French authors knew how to, how to write and that they did not. As uh, Virginia Woolf had it in a famous paper published in 1929 that they, the writers, do write better is an illusion perhaps, an illusion born of unfamiliarity and drama, but it is an illusion that is always willing support. She was, in fact, both right and wrong. Right, insofar as the idea that France was the nation of style and style of French category, had been shared by most people of her generation. Wrong, insofar as the IT was in 1929, not gaining support any longer, but rapidly losing ground. Uh, to, um, uh, for example, T.S. Yes, um, um, in the most important literary uh, journal of all this time, uh, T.S. Eliot's uh, criterion, French stylistic reference was everywhere in the uh, early 20s, disappearing in the late 20s and early 30s, and almost completely forgotten when the review uh, stopped being published in 1939. It would then be of uh, very little interest to study French stylistic influence at the level of a given writer. I do not mean by that that George Moore, or Henry James, or Joseph Conrad, or Virginia Woolf, to name but a few, did not have a specific relationship to the possible superiority of the French style, but that their specificities uh, can only be assessed if replaced in the collective representations of the time and age. And I propose for they chose very different writers, two of them not even born English, since by English writers, I mean, and I will mean today, England-based authors participating in England's literary love and debates. The case of Henry James is, in that respect, particularly interesting, since one could go as far as to say that the more he became English, the more his style became French. Of course, the young American writer and critic was already convinced that style was a French thing before he settled in London. But scholars were always intrigued by the fact that when James moved to East Sussex and started what we know as his uh, later manner, French almost all of a sudden started encroaching on his English. As early as 1912, an American linguist, Carol McIntyre, Jen was still alive at that time, noticed very accurately that in the latest novels of Henry James, 
lexical and grammatical Gallicisms started to form. And by Gallicisms, she did not only mean phrases or words that were not accepted in proper English, but mainly phrases or wordings that would sound more natural in French, such as, you can see my example, such as wrong dislocation, in which the constituent is postponed and replaced by a pronoun, as in the very first sentence of The Wings of the Dove in uh, 1902. She waited to get wrong for her father to come in, etc. McIntyre, for one, noticed that such constructions were nowhere to be found in the uh, 1875 version of Robert Hudson but suddenly appeared in the new version of the same novel in 1907. Quote, Christina says she's capable of taking that in the mark, not using the mark as a noun of address, but as a French person would say, elle est capable de penser cela la mère. Such dislocations would go unnoticed were they not part of a whole bunch of uh, other discrete but clear reminiscences of the French language in James' in James's later prose. In the awkward age, uh, McIntyre underlines, for example, that, quote, we have every few pages such expressions as of a strangeness, the thing was of a strangeness, or of a profundity, my poor child, you are of a profundity. These, by the way, are, there, are themselves French idioms. We could spend hours uh, discussing Gallicisms in Henry James, but the analysis would remain partial if kept within the limits of a writer-centered perspective. The James's stylistic Gallicisms gain a lot if replaced in the broader context of England's fascination with the achievements of, French, of modern French prose. If I, have to sum, if I had to summarize the history of uh, the illusion that Virginia Woolf found so puzzling, I would first insist on the fact that such a fascination was at its peak around 1900. That's to say precisely when James adopted his new writing manner. But things had started earlier, probably in the 1880s, after the death of almost all the major Victorian novelists, England had the feeling of having suddenly become a literary desert. Why French literary prestige was at its highest all over Europe, notably because of Zola's success. French literary domination was then only challenged by the newly acquired prestige of Russian novelists, but no one could read Russian, and almost everyone could read French. France, Taiwan, France was unrivaled. One could indeed draw a long list of quotations showing how much England felt in need of catching up. French prose is distinctly better than English, declared Robert Louis Stevenson in 1885. In a few years later, John Addington Simmons could add without much nuance, French authors are our masters in literary expression regarded as my art. Tardily perhaps, yet definitely, we English people have come to acknowledge our own inferiority in the art of prose and the necessity we are under of learning the rules of that art from our French masters. Such opinions were largely shared even out of literary circles. In 1907, for example, the famous educationalist Philip Joseph Hartog published a very influential book, The Writing of the English, in which he exposed the failure of English methods and wondered why English students could not write properly an essay, why any French student could easily write one with an excellent style. The positive merits, he said, the positive merits of average, average French prose need little witness at the present day. Not in literature alone, but in, but in every branch of prose, in history and politics, in religion and philosophy, in mathematics, 
and in the natural sciences with their various practical applications, we find the French writers even to be clear and attractive. In the 19, um, uh, 1920s, the idea that style was a French thing was still everywhere in England. Let us then have just one last quotation from John Milton Mary in 1922. Style is the quality which, it is often said, French journalists do and English journalists do not possess by nature. All right then, if everybody agrees, let's take it for granted. But does, but does it mean that there really was a French stylistic influence in England? Did English writers really try to write like the French? Show or Follin thought it legitimate to claim in 1928 that, quote, what style Putin had, has learned, he thought we got from, from, for the most part from the French. But there is precisely the illusion, since real French influence, influence was in fact quite limited. Of course, no other country quoted as much as England before his famous saying, Star is the man himself who still a long man. True it is also that England seems to have borrowed most of its stylistic principle from France, first from Proubert and his king, later from Remy de Gaumont. But England did not need France. It only happened that France had been preoccupied with the very question of style before England and had produced um, a whole body of essays and ideas before England woke up to such questions as um, how and how much does style matter? Are there rooms in prose writing? Is stylistic talent a completely individual thing? Or can it be good, etc.? France had already addressed such issues, and England had to take it into account. But it's more appropriate to talk about a French reference than about French influence. No, new ideas were emer emerging uh, in England, and a new sensibility to style had been emerging since at least the early uh, 1870s, neither of which had real French roots, but which could all find ready to use and well established uh, formulations in France. But if um, a real stylistic <coughs> influence is to be looked for, one must, of course, go back to uh, writing practices themselves for their um, just uh, standing with uh, stylistic theories. In that respect, French influence work was both marginal and strong. Marginal, since, for instance, England never imported the very first commandment of good writing in French, which is, as you probably know, the absolute interdiction of repeating the same word in, this, in the same paragraph, if not in the purpose of insistence and all within the bounds of a figure, figure of speech. As a French speaker myself, I must uh, confess that I never approved of such repetitions in the prose of my favorite writer, Virginia Woolf. Here is indeed uh, one example from the very first page of the House in 1927. Had there been an accident, a book, or any weapon that would have dashed a hole in his father's breast and killed him there and then, James would have seized it. Such were the extremes of emotion that Mr. Ramsey excited in his children, children's breast. And I have always been pleased to notice that French translators have systematically purged both writings of such terrible style mistakes. <laughs> As in the first translation of that passage in 1929, I don't have it in my paper, I'm going to read it from the screen. Uh, si James avait pu assez porter une hache, un tisonnier, ou tout autre arme susceptible de fendre la poitrine de son père et de le tuer sur place, là, dans ce coup, il s'en serait donc pas vrai. Tel et aussi extrême, Étaient les émotions que M. Ramsey faisait naître dans le cœur de ses enfants, et que tout le temps qu'il était là, c'est ça. Let me take a much more telling example, maybe. 
Uh, here are a few lines from a text published by Matthew Arnold in 1882, in which word, word repetitions are in bold letters. The smallness uh, by your acquaintance with the disciplines of natural science is ever in my mind. And I'm fearful of doing, of doing these disciplines an injustice. The ability and tenacity of the partisans of natural science make them formidable persons to conduct. The turn of tentative inquiry, which befits a being of deep properties and bounded knowledge, is the turn I would wish to take and not to depart from. At present, it seems to me that those who are forgiven to natural knowledge, as they call it, uh, the chief place in the education of the majority of mankind, leave one depositing out of their returns, etc. Repetitions here are all the more striking as Matthew Arnold's prose was to be regarded by the next generation not only as one of the best one of the best ever produced in the English language, but also as the most obvious example of an English French style. As Henry James had it in um, 1865, Arnold's style is he bit strangely and without detriment to its national character, a decided French influence. And again in 1984, in 1884, Arnold has been spoken of more than once as the most gunsized of English writers. James and many other critics had in fact little merit, of course, in recognizing in such lines the obvious influence of Ernest Renan's style. Uh, the famous style that Marcel Proust was to make film of in his uh, 1908 um, series of pastiches. But the fact uh, that Arnold never complied with the sacred rule of non repetition went completely unnoticed. And even when England uh, adopted Flaubert as its master in style, uh, style, it never adopted the rule the French writer was mostly obsessed with repetition. <coughs> This is why it seems to me more prudent not to consider that there was a real French influence on English prose, but to consider that English writers picked and chose in French prose what they needed. The word influence indeed conveys an idea of passivity, but here we are definitely dealing with a matter process. But England, nevertheless, did borrow some French writing habits at the turn of the 20th century, and we might go through some examples um, uh, that are almost telling as they are almost invisible. Uh, invisible because real stylistic Gallicisms are not linguistic, linguistic Gallicisms. By that, I only mean that the borrowed features do not necessarily or ever break any rule of the English language. I will first take but one example out of many. Most readers, and we have, most readers may have noticed that uh, Flaubert frequently resorted to a favorite rhythmical gimmick. It consisted in inserting a participial parenthetical or participial apposition before the last verb of the sentence. In Madame Bovary, we can best read L'homme laissa son cheval et suivant la bonne. On travaille tout à coup derrière elle. Such structures could, of course, be found in late Victorian prose before the Bell style started being influential in Britain. As we can see in, those, in these two sentences, the first from mid March and the second from the August. He now unlocked the box and, drawing from it in the key, etc. Or, he boasted oddly in his sight and father and chancing to be in the hall, etc. I think, nevertheless, that the use of such a structure is one of the reasons why Henry James thought that, that George Moore's A Man's Wife in 1885 wrote seemed to have been filled in French and inadequately translated. Let us come back. Indeed, the average frequencies are the structure in the two books. In Madame Bovary, we find it once in every four pages. In Anonymous Wife, once in every nine pages. 
that we use in this one thing more. Anyway, this leaves Elliot and Meredith uh, far behind with only one argument in every 127 pages or 170 pages. By page, I mean a rough 400 words. Only James Joyce's Dubliners, which was, as I know, uh, as you know, um, um, extremely influenced by both Flaubert and Moore, did better than Moore himself, and almost as well as Flaubert, with one case in every six pages. I know that. Joyce was not English, but I'll come back to that point later on in the night. If we now have a look at uh, uh, at uh, important novels published between 1990, 1890 and 1930, we can see that most writers used the structure even more than Zola, even, even though Zola was by far the most important foreign horse of French time in England. Let us, however, be extremely prudent and careful in interpreting all these figures. The low frequency of the structure in Henry James's prose probably reveals that he was so well aware of the Persian origin of the new stylistic found that he preferred, that he preferred to stay away from it. On the opposite, the pretty high frequency of the structure in Virginia Woolf's uh, probably reveals, reveals that uh, its Persian origin was not perceived any longer and that the structure was only perceived then as a literary gimmick available to anyone. Such analyses, analyses remain completely irrelevant though if they isolate one stylistic feature as I did. They start being relevant only if one works with at least a couple of features, devices or structures. We can then first make allowance for an obvious stylistic family resemblance shared by Flaubert again and some of the most important English Zola-esque writers. George Moore and Arnold Bennett did sometimes write as, as if they were trying to prestige Flaubert or French style in general, and notably in avoiding to uh, assign phenomena to their human, human origins. If we compare these samples, we see, for example, that French pronominal verbs find their counterparts in English passive verbs. Flaubert, toutes sortes de propos sans suivre, calendrier, anecdote, vandardise, mensonge tenu pour vrai, assertions improbables, intuite de parole qui bientôt s'éparpilla en conversation particulière. Moi, a variety of opinions broke forth, and everyone seemed to wake up. Anecdotes were told that brought the color to Kate's cheeks. Bennett, greetings and pleasantries were exchanged, and intimate conversations began. We can perhaps stay a little longer with Bennett to observe the possible interpretation in England of a very typical fin de siècle French divorce consistent in replacing the usual noun plus, plus adjective order by a sequence combining a noun derived from the adjective and a noun mentioning an object or a person. In this um, quotation from uh, Les Frères Zangano by uh, Jules and Edmond de Montcourt, instead of the expected transparent water, muddy riverbed, the red roots and the bluish riverbed, we have some the transparency of the water, etc. This was everywhere in French prose around 1880, and this was to be everywhere in England one or two decades later. By everywhere, I do not mean only in Zola-esque writers such as Bennett, at last they entered the human, the human coziness of the village, but also in Kipling, Kim posed before a filthy staircase that climbed the warm darkness of an upper chamber. I do not mean at all that Kipling underwent personally any French stylistic influence, but that he was sort of influenced by the influence. And so was probably T.H. Lawrence when he wrote, there was a vividness of plainy vegetation, a fierce seclusion 
amid the savage peace of the commons. It sounds so much like the law that we have noticed. The structure was soon perceived in the, as indeed as a very literary, that's to say, as a very effective from a stylistic point of view, but not necessarily, necessarily as very French, even though its southern diffusion probably had a French origin, and one of the reasons why we are tempted to consider that um, this device has a, a French origin is just because its benefit is very limited in English. As you know, in French, adjectives normally for the noun in English. One is never too wary in such matters anyway. It is indeed always extremely uh, easy and tempting to resort to a genealogical paradigm. After all, writers in France or in England we have very well used the same stylistic devices for the same reasons, but independently, just because they share the same zeitgeist, and or because they have to address the same expressive or essential needs. France before England, perhaps, and then England after France, but not England because of France. Cruel abstract nouns were, for example, very popular with French and English writers alike at the end of the 19th century. But it may be illusory to see a genealogical link between what we can read in George Moore and in what we can read in the late prose of uh, Victor Hugo or de Montcourt or even in Flaubert. Let's have a look at a couple of examples. Moore, they gazed at the bold mortalities of the Patrick Athens. Flaubert, par endroit, brillait de blancheur de baïonnette. Moore, sorte d'annesses, fell into distortions. Hugo, on voit se déformer des épaisseurs ou ailleurs des ressemblances. C'est des after ones, ouais. Tout ça fait, on ne sait pas. Moore, she fell into obtuseters, de bon cours, il tombait dans des béatitudes. But if we are careful enough not to talk immediately about influence here, the readers and the writers of that time were not. Such devices were indeed perceived as French, mostly because for a short period of time any stylistic novelty was considered as French. Reference is indeed much stronger than influence. Some critics even uh, so something French in the word order used by Henry James in the sentence line, he obviously reflected. Of course, perversion or post-perversion right, prose writing did frequently insert an adverb between the subject and the verb. Bateau nonchalamment s'appuyait du bras sur son épaule. But it is completely impossible in French place a parenthetical adverb between the verb if the subject is a pronoun. So here we are, back to Henry James, which gives me uh, a good opportunity to loop the loop and to come to a couple of concluding remarks. I will uh, not, however, use Henry James as my last study case. His relations to the French language and style are definitely intricate to be developed in a few words and his status as a pre-modernist rather than as a modernist uh, writer would take us a little further away from the chronological boundaries of this conference. Let me rather choose one of the most important figures of modernism, James Joyce. But the case of James Joyce uh, illustrates the need to keep a very broad perspective when studying minute stylistic features and to refuse uh, the usual restrictions of mainstream stylistics to the study of very small details. In 1989, was published a very remarkable book by John Porter Houston, Joyce and Prose, an exploration of the language of Ulysses. Some of uh, Houston's uh, results can yet be challenged. I think one that he insisted too much on the influence of Flaubert's prose or of French prose in general in, on Joyce's writing style. If we can find Flaubert's rhythmical structures in Ulysses, 
that density is just inconsequential when compared to what we find in Dublinus. And most of the time, these structures were not kept, that's to say, not recognized as such. When Tanuka was translated into French under the supervision of Joyce himself, one could say exactly the same thing about the possible influence of the French impressionistic phrasing that I mentioned before. When one reads in Ulysses the following sentence, Buck Balligan came forward towards the, uh, the reading of this month. Houston's question was, why do we have sub-phrasings in Ulysses? But we may go to ask, why do we have so few of them in Ulysses? If Darwinus can be read in a certain way as a tribute to French style, Ulysses can be read as a fair word to French style, and, um, and not the opposite. Neither is it uncommon to read that Irish tributes to French style should be considered as another form of political refusal of the English rule. Challenging English models, Irish writers have allegedly taken French ones. But we now know that at the turn of the 20th century, nothing was more English than looking for French masters of style. In his posthumous and very, uh, and probably unfinished essay, John Porter Houston also gave us a very cogent demonstra demonstration that all these stylistic features and, quote, syntactical distortions were in the 1920s uh, the signs of a possible autonomy of the language of, prose writing, of literary prose writing. But I would then insist again, not on the presence of such features in Ulysses, but on the scarcity. And, all things considered, contrary to Houston, I would then insist on the fact that the refusal of a certain French style may very well be one of the traits by which we can also define British and possibly Irish modernisms. This is, as you can see, my opinion that a stylistic should stop uh, being completely and narrowly defined as a language-based study of literary texts or as a, an interpretation-oriented study of writing singularities. If limited to the study of individual styles, it will always fail to integrate broader historical perspectives which require a collective overview and hypothesis on larger phenomena such as stylistic evolutions or stylistic trans transfers. And I uh, do thank you very much for your attention.